Hello everybody, today's video is going to be a follow-up to the previous video where we took a look at the Reckitt's torch. We're going to be selecting a new, higher power LED, as well as designing a nice constant current driver circuit using a flyback DC-DC topology, and that will be rated for around 40 watts. I spent 9 straight hours working on this, so make sure to sub if you haven't already. Let's get started. So to start with, let's take a look at the existing solution. What we can see is on the rear of the aluminium head insert, there's a PCB with two large exposed pads. The inner pad has a spring soldered to it, which will be the positive connection to the cell. And the large outer pad is designed to make an electrical connection to the outer aluminium housing through the cuts on the side of the board, which works, but I'm not sure if I'd trust that for super high currents. So that's the first thing I'm seeing that I probably want to change. Popping the board out of its friction fit into the aluminium head shows just a pair of wires coming out which go to the LED, just a positive and negative. It's also worth noting the tolerances on this board are quite tight if you want the friction fit. Hopefully if we're not using that for an electrical connection that won't matter as much for us. Flipping the board over reveals, as expected, some very minimal circuitry. There's two parallel N-channel transistors which will be switching the LED. There's a small 8-pin package which is probably controlling the PWM for those. That will also be in charge of what mode the torch is in. The ceramic capacitor above that is probably to store the charge so that it can detect when the power button has been pressed. In the last video when I mentioned that there's probably an inductor in here, unfortunately there isn't. So the PWM is really not great for the LED because every time the MOSFETs turn on, you are literally connecting the LED straight across the battery, which means you've got no good current regulation really, and it'll wear out this low quality LED very fast. One last interesting thing to note is the four parallel resistors at the top, which suggests they are doing some kind of current detection, current sensing, but still nothing that's really very adequate. Flipping the aluminium head over reveals the LED, mounted on an aluminium-backed PCB. These are pretty much the only way you can extract enough heat out of these high-power LEDs. The PCB itself has nothing on it except the LED in the centre and a few connection points for the wires heading down to the main control board. Removing the LED PCB and flipping it over shows the aluminium back. We'll be redesigning this PCB, but we'll still probably go for an aluminium backed PCB, unless I feel like splashing out and I could go for a copper backed PCB for slightly better thermal conductivity. Finally, looking at the aluminium head itself, this is a picture from a few days ago, and you can see how it's constructed. There's an outer part and an inner part. The outer part makes up the majority of the head, with the inner part being a plate that is simply attached to a rim on the inside of the larger part. I'm afraid I'm not a mechanical engineer, so I can't tell you much about how they're attached. But what I can tell you is that I can see a gap around the edge, and I don't think that would be very good for thermal transfer, because what we want is the heat from the LED to get into our hand as fast as possible. And right now it's got to go through quite a few different thermal interfaces, so if we can make those as good as possible, then we might as well. This seemed like the easiest to improve, so what I did is heat the whole thing up with a blowtorch, until it reached the melting point of some special aluminium solder I have, which is specifically designed for soldering two pieces of aluminium together. I then flooded this around the edges on the top and the bottom of that inner plate of aluminium, which ended up looking a bit like this. I think it will be a lot better for thermal conductivity, although I'm not that pleased with how it looks because I'm no welder. You can also see that the aluminium started oxidising around where I did that soldering, it's particularly bad on the inside, so it's important for me to remember that before I adhere down the aluminium-backed PCB I'm going to make, to sand all that off and make sure there's as little oxidation as possible between the two layers, as that hinders the thermal transfer properties quite a lot. And actually, finally, what I've done is I've made a 3D model of the torch head, just so I can play around with what can fit inside it, because there's quite a lot of space in there for inductors, capacitors. They're the two main big things that will be on our new control circuit. So with that, I can find a data sheet for, say, an inductor, and then I can check it on here just to see whether it'll fit. Of course, that's easy if it's a circular inductor and they just give a diameter and a height. But if it's a cubic inductor, I'd much rather just draw it in fusion than have to actually do some maths. Moving on to the main topic, the modified circuit, there's quite a lot of different things to think about. We have to spec all our different components, for example. And from those, the most important is of course the LED, or LEDs. I've spent the last few days thinking long and hard about this, trying to decide what I actually want from this torch. Naturally, I want to be pushing the limits of what I can cram into this torch. But, as I showed in the last video, I already have a nice, fancy Nightcore torch, so a second white torch wouldn't really do much. But as I hinted at there, there's other colours than white in the world. Looking on Mauser, I've found three main options. The first is sticking with white and going with this free XHP70 LED. A quick look at the datasheet shows that this LED is absolutely crazy. 
it has a forward current of 7.2 amps with a forward voltage of 6 volts. That's over 40 watts of power. Scrolling down a little, we can find the luminous output. There's lots of different versions of this torch, but roughly we're probably looking at 2,000 lumens, and that's at 2.1 amps. So if you're running at 7 amps, you're going to be getting close to 7,000 lumens, and that's real lumens, not fake Amazon lumens. These LEDs also have quite a high CRI, which is very nice. CRI stands for Color Rendering Index, and it's basically how full the spectrum is coming from the LED. So if you've got a low CRI, you'll probably have more lumens. You can see here the highest CRI LED. You can only get it up to 1,750 lumens, whereas if you go for a lower CRI, you can get 2,160 lumens. But the light won't look as nice. You won't be able to see as many colors, and especially if you're filming video or something, like a studio light, they'll have very high CRI. This specific LED, which is unfortunately the only one on this datasheet available on Mauser, is the 0D0BP450E, so that's this one. So we're looking at 5000 Kelvin colour temperature, a minimum CRI of 70, and luminous flux at 25 degrees of 2100 lumens. The reason why I pointed out 25 degrees is that, realistically, if this LED is dissipating over 30 watts, it's probably going to be very hot, so this luminous output is probably more realistic. Although it is a minimum, so you could get higher than that. As I said earlier though, white isn't really that interesting for me because I have a white torch and a brighter white torch, who cares? There's a lot of very bright torch content on YouTube already and I didn't want to just add to the pile, I thought I'd do something unique. Because of that, my next plan was to make an infrared torch, making use of these LumiLEDs LEDs, which each have a power of around 3 watts. Unfortunately, to get the kind of power I was actually looking for, that would require 10 in series, which has a few problems. The first being that that would cost £24 just for the LEDs. And secondly, it would have a forward voltage for around 30 volts, which we can create using a simple flyback converter, which is what we're going to be doing anyway. But coupled inductors are quite large, and I'd quite like to make a non-isolated flyback converter to save on space. That would then require running at a very high duty, which is then quite unstable. So I did an LT Spice simulation of this, and a duty of 92% would run quite happily, putting about 40 watts into this string of LEDs. But then a duty of 93% would take it to about 55 watts and would damage the LEDs and that's just not really where I want to be at. We want to be somewhere around 50%. Unfortunately infrared LEDs don't seem to be available in higher power than this, probably because it would be completely pointless. So I did a bit more looking, looking at different colours, I was considering ultraviolet as well as any normal colours, but the key thing I was looking for was still a high power LED. I wanted to have the fun of making a high power DC to DC converter and having to deal with all the heat that would be produced by the LED. And what I've ended up settling on is this, which unfortunately Mauser doesn't have a picture for, but the datasheet has a picture. It's a funny package because most of these LEDs have built in lenses like this Cree one or this LumaLeds one. This Osram LED does not have a built in lens, which means it has a very wide viewing angle, which isn't the best, but I think a combination of the lens and the sort of white reflector thing inside this torch should help to get most of that light out the front, at least when on the wide zoom mode. So why have I gone for this? Well firstly it's blue, and blue's a nice colour. After that it's very high power, which is something I was very keen for. So you can see it, it's got a 10 amp max forward current, which is absolutely insane. It also has a very convenient forward voltage of typical at 6 amps, 3.5 volts. At 10 amps it's around 3.8 volts, which is brilliant because that's about the voltage that our cell is going to be sitting at with a nominal voltage of 3.7 volts. Now you could just run this with a resistor to limit the current, which would be very boring and you'd be losing some efficiency. But the main problem with that is that when the cell discharges down to 3 volts, the LED is going to get quite dim. And unfortunately a forward converter would do the same thing because you can't boost the voltage up. So I'm going to be using as I mentioned earlier, a flyback converter to drive this. A few interesting things worth noting with this blue LED. There is actually a green variant, which is the same package, the same power. That's actually this blue LED with a phosphor coating, just like a white LED, to convert the blue light to something else. So that's converting the blue light to green light. That means you're sacrificing some efficiency because of that conversion, and I just want basically as much power as possible. Green is probably a more useful colour, because if you imagine walking in a forest or walking in a field, everything there's green, grass and trees, so green light makes sense. Whereas blue light is a bit weird, but I think that makes it even cooler. 
Another thing I found quite amusing is the area of the radiating surface. So it's 1.55 by 1.2 millimeters. And if you do the maths on that with the optical output, which they say up here, is between 5.6 and 8.2 watts, and that's at 6,000 milliamps. So if we imagine 10 amps, let's say conservatively, we're at 10 watts of luminous output. If you divide 10 watts by this area, you get over five and a half megawatts per square meter, which is just crazy. If you imagine that here in the UK on a bright summer's day, you'll get around one kilowatt per square meter. This is more than 5,000 times more intense than a bright sunny day. Of course, that's on the emitter itself. The moment you move away, the light disperses quite quickly, but it's still funny to think about. Now at the bottom of the data sheet, it shows some information about the binning for the both the power and the wavelength. So binning is basically, if you imagine they make a thousand LEDs, some are going to be better than others. So they test them all and then put them in groups, and usually they'll charge more for the best LEDs. I'm not really sure what this LED from Mauser would be, because if you look at the name, they say the DSEQ. And if it's a DS, it's the lowest power, and if it's an EQ, it's the highest power. So I have no idea which it is. They also say 2-3. For the wavelength group and it's either two or three not both so that's not very helpful scrolling down to the little key thing for the name also doesn't really help because it only shows the the first part of the name not the part after that shows the binning information so yeah i really can't find anything here that tells us but the main thing we're concerned about is the forward current and the forward voltage which are static for any of the different leds i would imagine the thermal output that we have to deal with is probably higher for these because if you're if you're putting in 10 amps at 3.8 volts that's fixed at 38 watts going in but the more luminous output you've got then the more efficient it is the less heat you've got to deal with so what i think we should do next is make a an lt spice simulation of the flyback converter we want to make to power this led so let's open lt spice and get started doing that so here we are in lt spice the first thing i'm going to do is add some voltage sources and for now we're going to have two voltage sources. There's going to be one representing the battery, which is going to have a voltage of, we'll say 4 volts for now, and an internal resistance of maybe 20 milliohms. And then the second voltage is going to represent our gate drive circuitry. So for now that's just going to have PWM of fixed frequency and duty, and is going to be driving the gate of our MOSFET. I'm giving the voltage source driving the gate a rise and fall time of 10 nanoseconds, because that's the rise and fall time, roughly, of the gate driver that I've found. And I'm starting off with a duty cycle of 50% by doing a, an on time of 50 microseconds and a period of 100 microseconds. So that will be a 10 kilohertz carrier. The next thing to add is our MOSFET and our main inductor. Thankfully the MOSFET that I've selected is actually available within SPICE. So I can just insert that exact MOSFET. And for the inductor, the specs that I've found are an inductance of 4.7 microhenry with a peak current of 26 amps, so I'm assuming the peak current on LT Spice represents the saturation current, and a series resistance of 3 milliohms. That was the highest inductance I could find in a package that would fit inside the aluminium head, and also had a high enough saturation current. It has to be able to withstand a continuous current of at least 10 amps, because that's what we're expecting the LED to draw. This one can handle 30 amps DC, which is quite nice. That inductor will definitely be able to handle the current draw, and potentially I might be able to swap it for one with a lower saturation current and continuous DC current, but a higher inductance. We'll get this all working first and then we'll try fiddling around with some values. I'm going to use a Schottky diode to minimise losses, and the one I've found isn't on LT Spice, but I can find a similar one. So here's a Schottky diode that's rated for 15 amps continuous forward current and 45 volts max reverse voltage, which should be enough. The next thing we want to add is our LED, which is probably the hardest part to try and find an equivalent of an LT Spice. Basically, we're just looking for the highest power LED we can find. And what we'll do is we'll adjust it, so we might need multiple in parallel to try and best represent our LED we've found, but we can fiddle with that once we've got the simulation working. Luckily, because we're using a blue LED, it has a similar voltage to any white LED, because of course white LEDs are just blue LEDs with a phosphor coating. That makes it quite easy to find models for it. So I found an LED with a forward current of 20 amps. So we'll see what forward voltage that has at 10 amps, and maybe that'll represent our LED quite well. Don't forget to add the ground node whenever you're running a simulation in LT Spice. And the last thing to add is chunky capacitors on the input and output. For the actual circuit, we're going to try and find some nice small compact ones, and we'll probably change the values once we've got the simulation to a state we're happy with. But for now, I'm just going to set them to very large capacitances, so that that's not a problem we have to deal with. 
I'm going to see what our voltage ripple is like with a 10 millifarad capacitor on the input and a 1 millifarad capacitor on the output. These values probably aren't stupidly unrealistic because the highest voltage in the circuit is probably under 6.3 volts, which is a common voltage rating for capacitors, and a 1 millifarad 6.3 volt capacitor, if you go electrolytic, it's pretty small. So now I'm going to simulate my circuit over a 50 millisecond duration, and I'm going to add a few different traces onto the plot that are going to represent useful things. First let's have a look at the output from our fake gate drive. Zooming in shows a nice square wave between 0 and 4 volts, and I've given it a 50% duty cycle to start off with. We can change that later on to play with various different parameters. What I want is five different traces. I want one for power coming out of the cell. I want one for power going into the LED. I want one for inductor current so we can see what our saturation current and continuous current need to be rated for. I want one for LED current so that we can make sure the LED we've selected is a good representation of the LED we're going to be using. And finally I want one for efficiency which we can calculate using the two power traces. Right, there we go. So you can see the green trace represents the efficiency with the scale on the far left. So we're hovering somewhere just below 70% efficiency at the moment. Then the red represents the power draw from the cell, which is a bit above 36 watts and peaks just below 60 watts when you first turn it on. Then the light blue one, which is hiding behind the dark blue one, that's the LED current, which looks like it's around 7 amps, so we've got to try and fiddle with it a bit to get that to 10 amps. And then finally, the blue trace shows our inductor current, which looks like it's peaking at around 36 amps, so we've also got to try and work to get that down a bit. So the first thing I'm going to do is go back to the LED data sheet and just check what the forward voltage should be with a forward current of 10 amps. Here we go, so 10,000 milliamps, follow that along. This line is 3.8 volts. This line is 4 volts, so that would be 3.9, so it's probably about 3.85. If we times that by 10 amps, then it's 38.5 watts is what we're looking for, and that should be a current of 10 amps. If we look on our trace, the pink one represents our power, which isn't at 38 watts. So let's increase our duty cycle and see if we can get that a bit higher. There we go, it looks like this LED is really close to what we're getting. It looks like if we look at the scale on the right, we're probably just below 40 watts, which is what we want, 38. And down here, the light blue trace is the current a bit above 9 amps, so 10 amps. That's exactly what we want. Now, despite our massive capacitances, we've got a lot of ripple. So I'm going to increase the frequency, which should reduce our ripple. And also, hopefully, it will help with our efficiency a bit. Let's start by just increasing it by a factor of 10. So now we've got a period of 10 microseconds and an on time of 6 microseconds, which will represent a frequency of 100 kilohertz and a duty cycle of 60%. It's definitely cleared up our ripple a lot. Now we're looking at around just under 70% efficiency with an output power just over 40 watts, so we need to reduce our duty cycle slightly. And a forward current of, yeah, a bit over 10 amps as well, as expected. Crucially, the inductor current has stabilised a bit. Now it's hovering around between 24 and 28 amps, which is quite high, isn't it? I think at this point, the best thing to do is probably just to fiddle around with frequency and duty cycle. I'm going to see how efficient I can get it and how low I can get the inductor current. So I've done a lot of fiddling with frequency and duty cycle, and I'm really struggling to break the 70% efficiency mark with the power output that we want. We can get higher efficiency by reducing the duty cycle slightly. So if I reduce this to a 50% duty cycle from 60, we're now looking at closer to 86% efficiency, which I suppose is alright, because when you've got the torch at full power, efficiency is the least of your concerns. One thing increasing the frequency has done, though, is definitely reduce the decoupling requirements on the input and output. So now I only need a 2.2 millifarad capacitor on the input and a 1 millifarad capacitor on the output for perfectly acceptable ripple. I think one other thing I'm going to try for attempting to get higher efficiency is just fiddling around with the inductor values a bit, which will then require probably changing the duty cycle and frequency, just to see if that if that helps our efficiency at all. Although, of course, if I increase it to 100 microhenry and it works brilliantly and we get 99% efficiency, it doesn't really help us because we're not going to get an inductor that big that will fit inside our torch head. One thing that affects the efficiency more than you might expect is the DC resistance of the inductor. So, despite this only being 3 milliohms, Reducing that to 0 ohms increases our efficiency from around 69% to 72%. We can see here, ignoring the weird transient stuff that goes on at the start, 
we're running at just below 90% efficiency and if we look at the current tracers we can see we're getting about 1.4 watts of output which is still pretty bright. One thing I'm wondering now though is if increasing the inductance isn't helping us much, can we decrease the inductance without much loss and then save on space on our circuit and potentially swap some inductance for some capacitance or something like that? So I've changed it to 100 nano Henry. Now we're getting a lot of ripple in the inductor current, but our efficiency hasn't really dropped off much. And at 100 nano Henry, we can definitely get an inductor that's smaller than the current one and can still handle up to 33 amps, it looks like. Let's keep decreasing and see what happens. Here we can see a major drop off at 10 nano Henry. We're only getting around 11% efficiency and we're getting almost 90 amps drawn from our cell. So it seems like 100 nano Henry is probably a good minimum inductance to aim for. And that requires a switching frequency of a nice round 1 megahertz, which I'm quite a fan of as well. So now I'm going to head back over to Mauser and look for inductors around 100 nano Henry. Uh, with saturation currents around 36 amps and it would have to be a continuous DC current of looks like it's hovering around 25 amps so 25 amps continuous 34 amps saturation and an inductance of 100 nano Henry let's see what we can find I also have to make the decision whether to go for through hole or surface mount so I'm gonna look at both I don't really have a preference as the rest of the components are quite small so they'll go on the other side of the board and they can just move around if there's any holes with leaders coming through I started off by just looking for anything greater than 100 nano Henry and greater than 25 amps DC and greater than 34 amps saturation but I got way too many results so now I'm gonna make a, a tighter window especially with the currents I don't care about inductors that can do 100 amps for the inductance I'm going between 100 nano Henry and 4.7 micro Henry because the previous inductor I found was 4.7 micro Henry and I couldn't find anything with a bigger inductance that would fit inside our torch head. For the maximum DC current I'm going to go for anything between 25 amps and 40 amps. And then for the saturation current I'm going to go for anything between 33 amps and 50 amps. Now that's taken our leaded results down to 4 which is quite nice but unfortunately on the SMD side, we've still got 230 to have a look through. So I'll start by just looking at the through hole ones. These two I'm already pretty sure won't fit. And this Vichy one is the same series as the one I was already looking at. So this one is 3.3 micro Henry. And it does satisfy all our, all our requirements, but it's bigger than what we need. So let's set this as a baseline and see if we can find anything smaller. This is a circular package with a diameter of... 19.1 millimeters and a height of 8 millimeters. The main problem with this is that 19 millimeter diameter is almost going to be taking up the full size of the board, which is around 24 millimeter diameter, and we need space on this on that side of the board for probably two big electrolytic caps. We can put all the small surface mount stuff on the other side, but that's going to be the same side as our cell, so there's no space for anything large like the inductors or the capacitors. Immediately when I come over to the SMD side. It looks like we've got a lot of small options, so if I just click on this first one, for example, we're looking at dimensions of just 14.5 by 13.5 millimeters, which fits in a lot nicer. Another thing I'm fairly keen for is a standard footprint so that I don't have to make a footprint in KiCad. With this many options, it's probably a good idea to further narrow down my results. So I think I'm going to start by trying out these length, width and height filters and see whether they actually work. A lot of the time with the more obscure filters such as dimensions, they haven't been entered for a lot of the components, so you could select every single length and you'd still get half the results because half of them haven't had a length given to them. It's also a bit tricky to do this because I'm not really sure what dimensions I'm looking for. How about let's see if we can get a 10mm cube. I suppose we've already seen that the series resistance makes quite a big difference as well, so actually I'm going to get rid of my dimension filters and I'm going to sort by lowest DC resistance first because that might be able to get us some gains in efficiency. Oh wow, look at this one, 125 micro ohms. Let's have a look at the data sheet on that. It looks like quite a nice package as well. We've got a lot of height, but not much space for an actual footprint, so we want something with a similar format to an electrolytic capacitor where they're often quite tall. And this is exactly that, 12 millimeters tall, 10 by six footprint. Now the one here is the 331. So if we have a look at the 331, we've got an inductance of 330 nano Henry, 
DC current of 32 amps, saturation current of 40 amps at 25 degrees C. This inductor is probably going to be pretty hot, but not crazy hot. And the saturation current at 100 degrees is 32 amps. Let's put in to LT Spice this inductance and this resistance and have a look at what kind of peak currents we're looking at. So if we zoom in on the current waveform, we can see we're looking at peaks of around 29 amps. So if we head back over to the data sheet, that means this inductor can probably get up to around 110 degrees before we run into saturation issues, which is absolutely fine because the capacitors we're using will be rated for 115 degrees Celsius as well. So we'll basically just say the inside of that aluminium housing is good to get up to just over 100 degrees. I also like this inductor because it's quite a lot cheaper than the one I was looking at before. So I think we'll go with that. That's brought the total cost of my shopping list down to below £20, which I'm quite pleased with. I'll go over all the components I've selected in a minute. If we assume this is running at 100 degrees Celsius, that's a saturation current of 32 amps. So let's tell LT Spice that as well, although it shouldn't make any difference because we're not reaching that. The next components I want to spec out are my capacitors, and the value of the input capacitor is determined quite heavily by the series resistance of our voltage source. So the series impedance of the cell that I've found, which I have managed to acquire a much better cell than the one that was in that power bank, is 16 milliohms maximum. So let's enter 16, and hopefully that won't affect things too much. It will probably reduce our efficiency slightly. There's also the series resistance of the torch body, which I'm actually going to model it as an inductor because there'll be traces on the board, there'll be probably one or two wires, and they'll all have some parasitic inductance. So let's say we're looking at a total inductance of maybe 20 nanohenry. Peak current, that's irrelevant. And the series resistance, so this would be the resistance from the cell terminals to the main input decoupling capacitor is probably going to be in the order of 20 nanohenry, although it's very hard to say. So now what I'm going to do is similar to what I did with the inductor, I'm going to reduce the value of the two capacitors and see how low we can go while still having an acceptable level of voltage ripple. I'll start with the input capacitor. They're fairly independent in the amount of ripple they cause. The ripple created by the input capacitor will be shown on the red line as that's the input power draw from the cell. Let's start by trying to reduce it to 1 millifarad. Well, that hasn't really made any difference, so that's a very good sign. Let's see if we can go to 100 mic. Getting down into the hundreds of microfarads is a very nice range to be, because that means we can swap from electrolytic capacitors to something like a multi-layer ceramic, which will have much better ESR and probably much better temperature handling as well. One thing worth noting is that our peak current drawer at startup has increased, but that's not really a problem, because if we've got a microcontroller that's responsible for our PWM, we can just slowly ramp up the duty instead of turning it on, and that will get rid of that. Even at 100 micro, that's still a very respectable amount of ripple. Let's see what 10 micro does. Oof, way too much. When I was looking for components for a previous iteration of this design that I made, I found some very nice 1206 Murata capacitors that have a capacitance of 220 microfarad. So I think we'll just go for those, because that's already very small. I'll get up the data sheet for those so we can correctly enter all of their parameters. So here they are, one pound each, which is quite a lot, but I only need two. Well, probably I'll probably use the same capacitor on the output. So looking here, we've got a voltage rating of 6.3 volts, which is fine for us. The highest we're expecting from the cell is 4.2 volts when it's fully charged, and the highest that will ever be across the LED, unless something goes horribly wrong. Annoyingly, I can't find any ESR in this datasheet, which is quite an important thing for a power electronic circuit like this. I've also noticed that this capacitor only has a maximum temperature of 85 degrees, so I might do some more looking and see what else we can find. I'll probably stick to this 1206 footprint now. I've just noticed you can get very high temperature rated capacitors, up to 260 degrees. But this will be on the cell side of the board, which I really hope won't be getting that hot. So we'll just go for anything greater than 125. Hmm, now the highest I can get is 47 microfarads. And I'm fairly sure that will have quite a bit of ripple. Let's set, set both to 47 mic and see what that's like. The ripple won't be noticeable because it'll be at 1 megahertz, but I'm mostly concerned about whether it affects the efficiency. Looks like the efficiency is still hovering around 72%, so that's alright. And this capacitor's still made by Murata, which is good because I'm a bit of a Murata fanboy. Next, let's have another look at our MOSFET because perhaps the one I picked before might not be optimal anymore. I can't really remember its specs. 
This is the MOSFET in question, made by Infineon. It can't be that bad if it's Infineon. So let's just check again on our inductor current, what's the highest current we're expecting the MOSFET to have to switch. Just over 27 amps, and it looked like this is rated for 30 amps continuous drain current, so we should be fine. There's a few important parameters that we're looking for in whatever MOSFET we end up going with. Of course, the continuous drain current has to be at least 30-ish amps. We want a very low on resistance, and also the gate voltage, the gate threshold has to be very low because this is just going to be driven directly off the cell voltage. So when the cell is fully discharged, it will be probably below 3 volts. So we need a maximum gate threshold voltage well under 3 volts. In this case, it's 2.2 volts, so we should be okay. Another thing to look at is the switching speeds. So if we're switching at 1 megahertz, then that's a 1 microsecond period. So we want our turn on and turn off time to be a lot faster than that. We're looking at a total, adding all of them together, of just over 20 nanoseconds, which is fine. That means around 2% of our time is going to be spent either rising, falling, or delaying. So I'll probably just stick with this MOSFET to save the hassle of looking at other ones. I was wanting to go silicon carbide with this, but I couldn't really find anything that was a, a good size and not too expensive. I think this is ATP, so that's another reason to go for it. They also say fast switching MOSFET for switch mode power supply, optimized for DC-DC converters. And what are we building? We're building a DC-DC converter that needs a fast switching MOSFET. So this seems perfect. It's also Infineon, and again, I'm an Infineon fanboy. So now is probably a good time to show my Excel I've made, my BOM, Bill of Materials, which includes the parts we've looked at so far, so the MOSFET, source capacitor, and the inductor. The source capacitor, I need to change that because it's also the load capacitor. Then there's also a few other things, so voltage reference, gate driver, diode, and microcontroller, which we'll have a look at what I selected for a previous version of this circuit and see whether it's still adequate. So this is the gate driver I picked, which was selected to match with the MOSFET, so it's probably still fine. Again, it's intended for use in DC to DC converters, which is exactly what we're making. And it's also quite simple to connect, so you've just got positive and negative input voltages. Then there's two inputs. It basically allows you to control the two internal transistors separately, but what we'll do is just join the two ins and the two outs, which is a way they show to have it configured, as you can see here, typical application circuit. So that gate driver seems fine. I mostly picked it because I wanted a very small package and this SOT26 is tiny. Next to look at is the diode. For this I was looking for something that could handle the same forward current as the transistor's continuous on current, which is 30 amps. And I was also looking for the smallest forward voltage I could find, which in this case was 400 millivolts. That'll help with our efficiency. It's also rated up to 150 degrees Celsius, which is nice. Although most semiconductors are rated up to 150 degrees or higher. It's also nice because it's the same package as the MOSFET, so we can get some nice symmetry in our board. Next is the microcontroller. So I was trying to find a very simple microcontroller that would deal with our PWM because it's a little bit more complicated than just turning an analog voltage into a PWM signal. Like for example, with the turn on, we have our big spike in current draw and it would be nice if we could avoid that. With a microcontroller, we can slowly ramp up the PWM duty over say one second. And this microcontroller is it's only 40p, it's an AT tiny, but I think it has everything we need. I'll just double check the data sheet. Basically all that we're looking for is a timer with a PWM output, which it says here. One 16-bit timer, two PWM channels. And then the other thing we're looking for is an ADC for feedback, which it looks like this doesn't have, so we'll have to go back and look at more of those. The reason we need an ADC is because we want to measure the current going through our LED, because with a fixed duty cycle, that will vary quite a lot with changes in cell voltage. So for example, if I change the cell voltage down to 3.5 volts, right now we're hovering around that nice 10 amp margin that we want. If I rerun that, now we're looking at a measly 6.5 amps, which is not what we want. So that's why we want feedback from the microcontroller. It can say, oh, the current's dropped a bit, I guess, because the cell voltage has gone down. Let's increase the duty to bring it back to what we want. That's also what the voltage reference is for, as a cheap microcontroller like this probably won't include a built-in reference. So let's go back to microcontrollers and see if we can find one with an ADC that's still small. That's the important thing. The AT Tiny one that I found before actually has the same footprint as the gate drive, that 6-pin SOT23 package, so I'm going to select that as my first option because I'd really like a microcontroller in that footprint if possible. Selecting that and in stock brings it from 40,000 to 15, so it's not looking good. Although maybe it is because this first one says ADC right there. We're also limited to just 896 bytes of flash for this one as an example, but that's not really a problem because our code is going to be so simple.
And this is a pick, I quite like picks. Let's see what other options we have and also their specs. So for example, this second one I noticed is an extended temperature range one. That will operate up to 125 degrees. I think it would probably be a good idea if we got every single component on the board to run at at least 125 degrees. So let's select that. That's taken it down to 7. Then I'm going to select pick 10 because I like pick. And now I suppose out of these options we'll just select whichever has the best hardware. So looking at the program memory size, if we sort by descending, both of these have 896 bytes, 16 megahertz, that's pretty quick, 8-bit ADC. They seem like they're exactly the same. It might just be a packaging difference. Let's have a quick look at the name. Yes, they are the same. So let's go for this top one because this bottom one mentions something to do with special order and it looks a bit scary. Oh, I like this. It's so cute. We're looking at 69p as well, which is nice. And if we quickly check out the voltage reference I picked, we're looking at 2.5 volts with 1% initial accuracy, which is definitely enough. I guess it'd be worth checking if the microcontroller actually has a VREF pin, or whether it uses an internal reference. I see here it mentions fixed voltage reference, so let's scroll down. I also need to check the operating voltage, because it's going to be ranging from about 3 to 4.5. So looking here we've got standard operating conditions. We're looking at the LF version of the chip. And that says that they recommend a supply voltage of 3.6 volts. Scrolling up slightly we can see the absolute maximum rating, which for our version of the chip is 4 volts. So I'll probably see if we can get a low dropout regulator for this. And then we have to bear in mind that, let's say we're dropping 200 millivolts, when the cells fully discharge at around 3 volts, that will be supplying this with 2.8 volts. That is above this 2.5 volts, which is what they recommend for an operating frequency between 16 and 20 megahertz. We're not going to be running at 20 megahertz, so that should be fine. I also opened a few other pages of the datasheet, so I've got the fixed voltage reference just to have a look at how that's working. And it looks like that's just an internal regulator that can be configured for 1, 2 or 4 volt outputs. It has the nice power of 2 voltage, but we don't really need that. I also opened a tab for the ADC because what I want to see is whether it's always relative to ground or whether we can change the negative reference as well. Yeah, so here it says VREF equals minus VSS. I wonder if that's something we can change. Ah, interesting. So the only references available are VDD and VSS. The internal regulator is just available as an input to the ADC. So you can see that here where it says FVR for fixed voltage reference. So I suppose we could continuously sample between our analog input and that, and then we wouldn't require a reference. Although, we do have to try and work out where we can put a current shunt in this circuit, because a high side current shunt would be very easy, it would just sit in here. A low side one is a bit trickier to do. Now the other important thing to remember is that it's only an 8-bit ADC, so if we wanted to put shunt in here and not lose too much efficiency, we might use say 1 milliohm, so then if we've got 10 amps going through our LED, that would translate to 10 millivolts. But with a 4 volt supply going to an 8 bit ADC, that would only give us a resolution of around 20 millivolts. So, what we could do is put a shunt in and then set up an amplifier to amplify that signal up. Or we could measure the forward voltage of the LED, which is a really bad way of controlling it. So, I think we'll probably go for the shunt and the op amp option. Let's have a look at how a 1 milliohm shunt would affect our efficiency. And we're not even thinking about the problem of a 1 milliohm shunt generating a very small voltage if you wanted to run the LED at, say, 10 milliamps. There we go. I put it in the wrong place a lot of times and had the nets set wrong, but it looks like it's not affecting our efficiency too badly. Let's just try 10 milliohms because really we want this shunt resistor to have as much resistance as possible. Let's try 100 milliohms. You can see because of the voltage drop across it, we're going to have to increase our duty to bring the LED current back up to 10 amps. So let's do that now. And now we haven't even reached 10 amps and the efficiency is dropping off a lot. So let's try and keep it at 10 milliohms and see, see how efficient we can get it. So with 10 milliohms, we have to bring our duty up to 65%. Adding this series resistor with the LED also has the convenient effect of smoothing the LED current a bit more relative to the voltage of the output decoupling capacitor. With 100 milliohms, the efficiency drops to around 55%, which I'm not happy with. So let's go with the 10 milliohm shunt. Perfect. Now that we've got that resistor there though, the forward voltage across the LED is not going to be the same as the voltage across the output decoupling capacitor, 
So I just want to check that voltage to make sure it's not going to get too high. And that's looking like it hovers around just above 4 volts, which is fine because our capacitor is rated for 6.3. So our 10 milliohm shunt will give us a voltage of 100 millivolts at the full current of 10 amps. Realistically, the LED is probably going to be run at maybe 100 milliamps most of the time, which would then only give a voltage drop of 1 millivolt. So what we need now is a simple amplifier circuit coming off this to give us a nice big voltage that will use the majority of our ADC range. And we can also add a filter in there just to smooth out some of this ripple. So for an op-amp, I'm just going to try and find a generic device in op-amps. I'm just looking for one like this with, with no weird extra pins like some of these... Uh, other op amps have like this. Let's just go for the AD711 and if we have any issues we can swap it I guess. Just thinking about this actually, I think you'd probably want the feedback to go to VDD and not ground because we don't want to amplify it with respect to ground, we want to amplify it with respect to VDD, if that makes sense. And now for our gain, if we were looking at an output of 100 millivolts from the shunt at our maximum current of 10 amps, then we always want the output of the op amp to be less than the supply voltage, which let's say will be anything down to 3 volts. In that case it would be a gain of 30 to take 100 millivolts up to 3 volts. So I'm thinking a gain of 20 would be quite nice, because we can do that with a 10k and a 1k resistor. That would give a maximum output voltage of 2 volts, which is definitely going to be well below minimum cell voltage. Let's have a look at that output voltage now and see what it's doing. I'm also going to get rid of some of the other things, so if we just assume this is all going to be left as it is, we can get rid of the efficiency and the input power, output power. We're basically just, we care about the diode current now. There we go, so I've now put the diode current in red, and the green shows the output from our op-amp circuit. And the startup's probably the bit we care about most, so let's take a look at that. And there's definitely something not quite right here, because if I type in 4 minus, then that should give us our sort of representation of the current, if you account for the fact that it's referenced to VDD and not ground. But the highest voltage output we have here isn't a peak diode current. So let's have a look at the input to our op amp. And it looks like here we have our first problem, which is that the voltage on this side of the resistor is actually going to be higher than VDD, not lower, which makes it quite difficult to deal with. I think what I'm going to do is divide this voltage down, reference to ground, so we can see this peaks at 9 volts. So if I divide it by, say, 4, that would then take that down below 3 volts. Right, now I'm dividing it down a bit. Let's see what that does. I'm going to get rid of the blue voltage, because now what we care about is this voltage. Ah, so what doesn't help is that VDD gets pulled down because of the series resistance of the cell and the torch housing and the connections between the cell and the board. Let's plot VDD minus V net 1 to give us the voltage across the resistor. It's a nice rainbow, this. And you can see that's working well because you can't see it. That's because it's been put on the same scale as the current, so they track each other perfectly, which is good. Now let's do the same, but with the output of the op-amp, which is net 3. Oh, why am I struggling with this so much? I think what we want is differential amplifier. So let's have a go with one of those. I've almost made one already, I just need to connect this to VDD, which is what I had before. Hmm. I think maybe a different op-amp might help, because I'm not sure if that one can do rail-to-rail -rail inputs and outputs. Right, I think I've finally got it working. So I can probably simplify this circuit a bit, but we've got two potential dividers, one on either side of the shunt to bring the voltage down to within the range of the op-amp inputs, and then a simple differential amplifier with a gain of 47. The gain of 47 makes sense because the potential dividers here are halving the signal, so when I originally said a gain of 30 would be our limit, that would now become a gain of 60, so 47 works quite nicely. I'll just do some low current tests and see whether it still works at around 100 milliamps. It looks like it does. If you ignore the weird startup transients which are over in a couple of milliseconds, we're getting an output voltage that nicely represents our LED current. You can see what I did as well is I created a separate VDD supply which is basically like a super smoothed version of the main input voltage because that 47 mic cap at full current 
it still has quite a lot of ripple on it, which I think would probably mess with the op amp and the microcontroller. So the only bits of circuit that aren't on here now is basically just the microcontroller and the gate drive. The output of this differential amplifier would go into the ADC of the microcontroller, which would then generate a PWM signal, send it to the gate drive, and that would drive this MOSFET. Overall, it looks like this circuit's actually working quite nicely. So the next thing to do is make this circuit in KiCad then turn it into a schematic, and then I guess we'll just order it and see what happens. I also need to make the aluminium backed PCB for the LED, but that should be very easy. So here's my schematic in KiCad. I've already shown how to make a schematic in previous videos, so I've just done it off camera to save time. I've made a few changes, so let's work from top to bottom on the schematic to see what's changed. First of all, I've added a fuse because I thought it would be a good idea. The new lithium cell that I've got is even scarier than the previous one at the power bank, so a 30 amp fuse should do nicely to try and make my house last a little bit longer. I've also added a 3.3 volt low dropout regulator for the microcontroller because that has an absolute maximum voltage of 4 volts, so that should just help protect that a bit. I think it's got a dropout of about 300 millivolts, so the supply to the microcontroller will start to drop when the cell gets low, but that shouldn't matter hopefully. Next I've added a debug header, which is for the microcontroller over here, and that will be what I'll use to program the microcontroller. Coming over to the microcontroller itself, I've gone for that PIC10 chip that we found on Mauser for about 50p. Here you can see we've got the PWM output on RA0 and on RA2 we've got the current sense input. MCLR and the two ICSP pins, they're debug connections and it's also got a 100 nanofarad decoupling capacitor. Then for the flyback converter itself, you can see here we've got the gate drive, again driven from that 3.3 volt supply. That's got a slightly bigger decoupling capacitor because gate drives tend to draw quite significant gulps of current. That then drives our MOSFET, you've got the big inductor here, smoothing capacitor, and then I've changed the shunt resistor to a 5 milliohm shunt. And the reason for that is that I found you can buy current sense amplifiers that basically just have an input that go onto the shunt and then an output that goes to your microcontroller, which is really nice. So this one I've found has a gain of 50, which means my previous one, it would have tried to output five volts, which would be too high. So with this five milliamp shunt, the highest this will try to output at the full current of 10 amps is 2.5 volts, which should work nicely. I've also added a small RC filter on the input just to try and get rid of some of the ripple. So now it's just time to head over to the board editor and turn this into a reality. Here you can see I've already imported the components. There was just a few extra caps that I just added. And what I have to do is I have to squeeze these into this circle, which is a 26 millimeter diameter. That's the size of the existing board and I can't go any bigger than that because it has to fit into the aluminium head. So I will be back once I've got all that sorted. Right, many hours later, I've finally finished my board. Here it is. So you can see we've got the three big terminals for the LED anode and cathode and ground. And then battery positive is actually this massive pad here. Because if you remember what I showed at the start of the video, the current board has a spring soldered onto a big central pad, which is what I've replicated here. Let's have a quick squiz in the 3D viewer. I've basically got a high power side and a low power side. So this is the low power side. The only high power thing on here is R3, which is the shunt resistor. So that's a five milliohm shunt between battery positive here and LED cathode there. Then if we flip over to the back, you can see we've got at the bottom here, the MOSFET. Then up here, we've got the Schottky diode. All these veers are to try and get the current through the board to this side. Uh, I've done the whole of this side with big fills as well, which looks quite cool and should hopefully help with some of the heat dissipation from the MOSFET and the diode. The inductor unfortunately doesn't have a 3D model. Here's the two 47 mic caps. And then if we flip over to the other side, we've got at the bottom, the gate drive for the MOSFET, which is on the other side, that powers it through a veer. Then here's the voltage regulator along with its decoupling. This is the inductor for smoothing the voltage going to it. Then this is the microcontroller. These pads, are almost all of them are for the debug, so I didn't end up putting a header on because it wouldn't fit. So basically I'll solder wires onto those, program the chip, and then desolder them. Apart from this unlabeled pad, which unfortunately I couldn't use the back layer because we've got high power stuff going on. So I'm going to have to run a single jumper from there to there because I just couldn't work out how to do the trace and I, had to, I ended up giving up. Um, then this chip is the amplifier for the current shunt. The current shunt's here. You've got a line coming up. This line goes through this massive pad and connects to the other side. This is the RC filter for it. That then feeds into the amplifier. 
the output of that goes up into the microcontroller. The microcontroller generates a PWM signal, which comes all the way down here into the gate drive. The gate drive then amplifies that signal and sends it through this little hole, which is a veer. On the other side of the veer, you've got the gate of the MOSFET. The MOSFET then turns on and off, switching current through the inductor. When the MOSFET turns off, the current that is put into the inductor comes back out through the Schottky diode and then through the LED. And that's sort of a very simplified explanation of how this flyback converter works. Anyway, I'm sure this video is very long, so it should be about a month probably before this comes. And then I'll do another video showing the assembly and testing of it, which I'm very excited for. There is, I haven't forgotten about the aluminium backed PCB for the LED, but I'm going to do that in a few days time and I don't want to delay the release of this video. It's really not that exciting, it's just going to be a PCB with a single LED on it. Right, well, well done for making it to the end. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you in the next one.